everybody. How are you doing? Hi, Paul. I'm Paul Servatka. I'm the Vice President of the Chicago AMS, and I'd like to welcome you to the next 2018 uh, Chicago AMS meeting, along with the COD AMS group, which is here. I uh, just wanted to make a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, we have uh, the next event will be Chris Murphy will be talking on flooding models on the 28th. So uh, make sure you mark your calendars four weeks from tonight. Uh, we'll be talking about that. Should be good on flash floods or flooding in the DuPage County region. We will also be having a couple of talks coming up, one at the end of March sometime, and then we will have our banquet sometime, at, I think it's the 20th of April, and we will announce that as soon as we sure up something. It should be a pretty exciting event. Uh, also, I want to keep it put out to you guys, March 10th, is the DuPage County uh, advanced spotter training. So that is an opportunity. And we have a bunch of people from here who will be talking. Ricky Castro, Danny Neal, uh, uh, Walker Ashley, maybe Victor. I'll be helping there too. So a bunch of us. For students, that's an extra credit opportunity worth a ton of points. Uh, it's ton. an expensive thing. It's a ton of points. And you just, it'll be held at Wheaton College. And if you just do DuPage Severe Weather uh, on Facebook or just the internet, you'll find a search to that for registration. Also, this is an opportunity for students. We need volunteers. You have to be there really early, but your uh, $40 fee for the day, including lunch, is waived if you would serve there. So that's March 10th. Uh, it's pretty busy. So I guess that's it. Uh, if anybody's interested in tornado chasing too, let me know. We need to fill those trips ASAP. And I think that's the only thing we've got uh, from my point of view. Victor. Okay. Uh, here's the page that Paul discussed for the DuPage County Severe Weather Seminar. Uh, I, is there like an early registration cutoff or a discount? Okay, there's the $40. Uh, looks like they want you to register before uh, February 23rd would be the cutoff there. So if you're thinking about doing that, I'd probably uh, get it done in the next week or two. Uh, a picture from last night, the super blue blood moon. Of course, uh, our view of it didn't look that great. Uh, I didn't really go outside and try to take any pictures of anybody. I think Evan, you had some pictures on Facebook, but you said it wasn't that great around here. This is somewhere in the uh, Great Basin, Intermountain West, uh, I'm pretty sure. Richard Nakatani with a beautiful photo of the uh, super blue blood moon. That was a tongue twister. Uh, I thought also, uh, before I introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, we just take a quick look at weather observations, uh, both locally and a little bit more globally. Uh, here's the recent sea surface temperature anomaly map. Uh, for the past two weeks, so this is just an animation of daily SST anomalies, and uh, you can still see the impact of La Nina uh, really extending all the way out to the dateline uh, from the equatorial uh, portions of equatorial South America and the Pacific. So uh, the atmosphere is still seeing major influences of this La Nina, but the impacts in many places across the United States have been a little bit different uh, than what we normally expect. Here's the local climate summary from today from O'Hare. I'll just highlight a couple of things here. Uh, I think this is as of today, yeah, just put out by the Weather Service Office in Chicago by our colleagues. Uh, max temp today of 42 at O'Hare. A couple of things just to note, in terms of heating degree days, so if you get an idea of uh, you know, how much you're running your furnace here, heating degree days, we're actually very close to normal. We're only down about 34 HDDs uh, since the beginning of the winter, so temperature-wise, um, while that can't tell you, obviously, direct temperature anomalies, it gives you an idea of really how much your unit's in your furnace, uh, pretty close to average. And then the other thing here is snowfall. And generally, in, of course, in La Nina patterns, uh, we're generally above average across portions of the Midwest for precipitation, generally a toss-up for uh, temperature, which is actually kind of what we've seen so far. Precipitation-wise, we're actually in a little bit of a deficit here. Uh, these numbers of snowfall, you can see since the, uh, if you look over the entire snowfall season, down about 10 inches at O'Hare since December 1st. So meteorological winter, we're looking at about 9.1 inch deficit. Um, it does look, however, if you've looked at the pattern coming up here, this is just an operational run of the GFS, but the European and many of the ensemble members uh, look like a barrage of clipper type systems coming out of the Pacific Northwest 
and Canada. Each one of them, you know, a quick blast of maybe a few inches of snow. Hard to get really big snows in these types of systems unless you get a nice big wound up panhandle type of low. But uh, this can be often be a very snowy and uh, sort of cold pattern. So we'll see if the GFS is on to anything. This is, uh, I, Matt, you've probably watched the models or the weather service folks more than probably anybody in here and can comment on the uh, state of the pattern, at least across the Midwest. But from what I've seen, it does look like uh, a fairly snowy pattern here as we, end, as we go into the first portion or the first couple of weeks of February. So any questions or comments or uh, you know, general questions about the current weather pattern or any announcements? Our student chapter, did you guys want to say anything? Or I think Paul did a good job with the announcements. Uh, the other person, I think Patty is here. Patty, uh, I have two more dues paying members for you, uh, but I don't think our balance has really changed since last meeting, so um, we don't really need an update there. Um, okay, thank you. We need to invest that. We could have made 28% on that last year in the stock market. That was terrible. What were we thinking? Okay. Uh, all right. All right, any other comments or business from uh, chapter officers before we move on to the formal presentation? Okay, all right, all good. Uh, I'd like to, uh, it's my honor to uh, introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, her name is Dr. Kimberly Hogwind. She's a graduate, uh, undergraduate recipient of uh, Central Michigan University under Dr. Marty Baxter and then transferred to Purdue for her master's and PhD and we've actually worked on a number of projects together and our dissertations were actually very similar so uh, we got to know each other from weather conferences and I think she'd be I thought she'd be a great presenter to our chapter uh, and sort of a, as I said in the email a nice segue into severe weather season uh, talking sort of about some of the historical events of our past and also uh, potential for change in the future. And I just want to mention that I think Kim has the coolest last name that you can possibly <laughs> have for a meteorologist because it actually means it's Dutch for high wind, That's right? Correct. Is that right? Yeah. That's pretty cool. So, uh, I, you know, I can't say that my name means anything uh, cool, but her last name is, is, is interesting. So let's give a warm welcome to Kim, hazardous convective weather climatology and climate change. <laughs> Thanks, Victor, for that nice introduction, and thanks, Paul, for the invite to talk today. So my last name kind of destined me to go into weather, so <laughs> um, tonight I'm going to talk about some of the projects that I've worked on that relate to severe weather in the context of, of climate. But before I get started, I just want to acknowledge a few of um, my collaborators, so Mike Baldwin at Purdue, Jeff Trapp at U of I, our own Victor Gensini, now at NIU, Harold Brooks, and then the wonderful folks um, at the Purdue um, Computing Center, because um, as you'll see through my presentation that I do quite a bit of modeling work that uh, requires high performance computing. So just to get started here, what is hazardous convective weather? Well, this is just a terminology to describe severe thunderstorms and the hazards that they produce. So a severe thunderstorm is defined as one that goes on to produce either a tornado, um, strong convective wind gusts greater than 50 knots, uh, and large hail greater than one inch in diameter. And they have their significant severe counterparts, which are a higher end on the spectrum. So tornadoes rated you know, on the Fujita scale or enhanced Fujita scale greater than two, um, winds greater than 65 knots, or um, hail greater than two inches. And I have some of my um, uh, favorite photos here of some of these higher end events. I absolutely love this uh, photo here from the Palm Sound Sunday outbreak in 1965. Um, in the lower right, uh, this is some large hail that we found. Um, we we're actually out with one of the COD storm chases in South Dakota in uh, June of 2014. In the upper right-hand corner, this is the event that actually sealed uh, my career path. Uh, this is the May 31st, 1998 derecho. Um, I will admit I was a bit of a nerd and uh, set my alarm for 3 a.m. because I knew this was coming. So we had about... 100, 130 mile per hour wind gusts in the Grand Rapids area. That's where you're up. So why do we care about 
severe thunderstorms and the hazards that they produce. Well, they have major um, impacts on society. They uh, are a threat to life and property. So this is just an example here of the tornado damage. Um, in this particular case, this is um, the EF5 in May of 2011 that hit uh, Joplin, the population center. Um, severe straight line winds do a significant amount of damage. This was um, a bow echo event, I believe, in 2015 near Traverse City that downed quite a few trees and they were without power for a few weeks. Um, large hail does a lot of damage to crops, uh, roofs of homes and businesses. Um, cars, etc., and wind-driven hail. If you've never seen damage photos of that, it's, it's pretty, pretty spectacular. So we care about uh, severe thunderstorms because of their impacts. Uh, and also, if, if you're in, into weather, you also think they're pretty fascinating to observe. Uh, severe thunderstorms, they account for quite a, a lot of the big proportion of the billion dollar weather um, disasters and actually they've been increasing in the last 10 to 15 years. Caution you though not to really jump in and say is this due to climate change because there are a lot of different factors that come into play here, uh, particularly uh, changing our landscape. So you know urban centers, we've got sprawl, uh, population growth, so we just have more stuff in the way to damage. So the main themes I'm going to talk about today uh, as far as severe thunderstorms and climate system, we want to look at what has happened in the past. What is our normal, so our climatology? And then we'll switch gears and kind of look more towards the future. So in particular, how might climate change impact our severe weather patterns, if at all? And so it's important, I think, to understand our past before we even look to the future. And the two main ways that I'm going to talk about how we approach these problems today, we're going to, the first one is implicit modeling. And what I mean by this is we're actually going to look at just the large scale atmospheric conditions that are conducive to uh, severe thunderstorm formation. And then we'll look at explicit modeling, which in this case we use actual models, high resolution uh, models, uh, to try to simulate the individual thunderstorms. So looking um, at the climatology of severe thunderstorms, you may think it's very, the, uh, the first intuition would be to look at the reports of severe weather. So the Storm Prediction Center has uh, a pretty robust uh, data set going back to 1950. It's kind of considered a gold standard as far as the rest of the world. However, it's not without it. its downfall. It's based on eyewitness accounts, so you actually have to have someone there to observe the event and to report it. Um, the inflation of, of, of reports has been significant. Uh, from the beginning of the database to current. This figure in the upper right hand corner um, is the number of tornado days or tornado counts per year and you see a significant increase and this is likely uh, non-meteorological. Yes? We can't see the uh, graph uh, details uh, on there. When did this start? I mean, 1950. Okay. Yep, 1950 I believe to 2015. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, we'll continue. I'm not sure if we can. Okay, great. Okay. And there's many non meteorological factors that also play into um, this database and impact the trends that we see. So uh, the uh, advent of, of Doppler radar, you know. We now all carry basically computers in our back pocket, connected to the internet with photos and videos, et cetera. So this is really not uh, a good data set to use uh, to look at any kinds of trends because of these problems. So instead, we kind of look more at an ingredients-based approach. What 
uh, atmospheric conditions should be in place for severe thunderstorms to form. So we look at it, this recipe, so severe thunderstorms. We need what? We need a abundant low level moisture. We need sufficient instability, um, strong vertical wind shear. And lastly, we need some kind of lifting mechanism to get the storms to initiate. And generally, these, the first two, are, we combine them into one to convective available potential energy or CAPE. And so studies have kind of looked at uh, these large-scale uh, conditions, and we generally use CAPE in vertical wind shear, and their product has been found to be fairly sufficient in showing, um, supporting uh, uh, severe thunderstorm formation. And we could apply these to reanalysis data sets. And what reanalyses are are basically uh, a gridded data set that incorporates um, observations into a, a numerical weather modeling system to produce a, a data set that is a best guess estimate of the state of the atmosphere at any one time. And so some of Victor's uh, previous work has, has looked at this, and we haven't really seen any long-term trends yet. There are some trends we see in the last maybe 15 or 20 years. But given the length of, of time that we're seeing these trends, they're not significant as of yet. So some of the limitations of, of looking at severe thunderstorms in this way with the environmental conditions is that we actually have to have the storms initiate in order for them to realize these conditions. So we're not taking into account that lifting mechanism that I was talking about. Also, the environments, they tend to overestimate not only the, the frequency, but also the coverage of severe thunderstorms. And the correspondence between favorable conditions and an actual storm forming in them is not one to one. So I, I tend to make this analogy of thinking of it as uh, the convective outlooks that the Storm Protection Center looks out and then the ensuing um, storm reports for that day. And lastly, it's really hard to determine individual hazards because they overlap in these environments. So tornadoes, hails, and high wind events can all occur within very similar environments. With that said, um, there's a new reanalysis data set, fairly new anyway, that goes back further in time than some of the previous uh, reanalyses that have been used here. So I'm going to uh, show some work that Victor and I did uh, fairly recently, uh, some preliminary results looking at the uh, environments favorable for severe thunderstorms uh, going back to 1851 using the 20th century reanalysis. And this is actually a pretty interesting data set. It only assimilates surface pressure observations, monthly sea surface temperature, and uh, sea ice to produce these conditions. Um, and looking, uh, comparing to other reanalysis data sets, it's been shown to be pretty, pretty good. Um, but there is a, a lot of uh, more uncertainty earlier in the data set, and that's going to be reflected in some of our results. So we'll first start out with just an annual time series looking at the mean number of severe weather days. Here, a severe weather day is defined as when the Cape time shear exceeds 20,000 as our threshold at any time. And so we, from this, we see a significant increase from the beginning of the time series through about 1920, 1930 or so, and then it kind of becomes more stable. We know that the earlier portion, 15, first 15 years of the data set, there's a low pressure bias in the assimilated surface observations. So we know that at least that part of the, the data set is, is very uncertain. But I would say, at least from this figure too, I would say anything before 1900, maybe, maybe treat with a grain of salt. We can look spatially here um, in the mean climatology for different 30-year periods going back from the beginning through the most current. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have the number of days where 
we have extreme instability, so where the CAPE values exceed 2,000 joules per kilogram. And on the right-hand side, we have the spatial um, severe weather days, so the CAPE times shear greater than 20,000. One thing we notice is in the central Great Plains, at least beginning in, in the first two periods, uh, the magnitudes are a bit less, and they tend to increase once you get into the mid um, 1900s or so, which kind of agrees with the previous figure here. But anyway, this generally highlights where we do see most of our severe weather annually, which is in the, the southeast and in the central and southern Great Plains. Now moving on, we can look in, in phase space of CAPE on the x-axis and shear on the y-axis. And this is just departures from the overall mean. And we see the, the same story here is that the big, towards the beginning of the data set, set, our CAPE and shear values are concentrated in lower shear, lower CAPE area. And they tend to increase until you get into the mid-1900s, and they sh tend to become a little bit more stable. So just a quick summary. This was some pr uh, preliminary results that we, we found. Um, and this is kind of the, the longest record of uh, severe weather environments that has been produced to date. Uh, prior to 1950, there's an increasing trend in, in severe environment frequency. We're not quite confident that this is physical, and it's probably due to uh, the greater uncertainty earlier in the data set due to uh, limited surface pressure observations. Um, once you get post-1950, the variability among the 56 ensemble members tends to go down uh, the density of sur sur as the density of surface observations uh, go up. Um, similar to some of the previous work that I showed, had shown, um, severe weather environments have been relatively unchanged annually or even decreasing since the radio sound era. So now that we have this data set going back further, what, what else can we do with it? I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more interested in history I, I am. And so there are a lot of historical severe weather outbreaks, tornado outbreaks, that we don't have any uh, observations for. Maybe we have some newspaper clippings, uh, uh, journal, old journal articles or photos of the destruction. So can we actually use this data set to reconstruct some of these historical outbreaks? Well, we're going to give it a try here. So this is a project that I've been working on with Victor for too long. Four, yeah. four years now. <laughs> yeah, three and a half years. Um, we're still working on it. Um, the one event I'm going to show tonight is the infamous Tri-State Tornado in March of 1925. And my main question here we want to look at is how might this event have been forecasted given today's numerical modeling capabilities? So could we use a high resolution model such here as WARF um, and produce some kind of guidance, pseudo guidance, or recreate some of these events? So using many of the same short-term weather forecasting techniques that we use today for, for severe weather. Um, in this case, we're going to be looking at updraft helicity. For those of you that uh, look at some of these high-res mod models and do some storm chasing, you're familiar with this variable. But basically what it is, is it measures the amount of rotation that's correlated with a storm updraft, which is a hallmark of a, a mid-level mesocyclone associated with supercells. So just a, a quick little background of this event. Uh, likely was a, would have been rated an F5. Um, there were 695 fatalities associated with this single tornado, making it the, uh, the deadliest tornado in U.S. history. Uh, destroyed over 15,000 homes, 
uh, was on the ground for about 220 miles in three and a half hours, though it was likely probably a tornado family rather than a single tornado. And it traversed three states, hence its name, Tri-State, um, and crossing from Missouri to Southern Illinois into Indiana. So the previous uh, work has kind of looked at this. And the storm ten formed near the low pressure center near, near a warm front. Uh, but it was not the only event that day. So this figure tends to highlight areas that saw severe um, thunderstorms uh, with hail and tornadoes. In fact, uh, this was considered an outbreak day. So while that single tri-state tornado uh, killed 695 people, there were nearly 750 fatalities that day and over 2,000 injuries. So looking at just the, the 20th century reanalysis data with the 56 different members, what did the soundings look like in Southern Illinois that morning? Um, so we can see here, we're just looking at the vertical, the profile of temperature, uh, moisture, and wind speed here. We see generally pretty good lapse rates um, in the mid-levels, a strong wind shear, a nice fish hook hodo here. If we go closer to the time of the event advancing, we do see some cooling and drying in the mid-levels, which is good. Still that strong shear. Um, but overall, this soundering would, would tend to, to show that Cape would be fairly, fairly low for this event, at least from the surface base. We can look spatially, looking at the different members here, the Cape values. And we, again, we do see our event here is kind of the northern fridge of the instability axis. So K values tend to be less than 500 joules per kilogram here. In fact, we can um, look at the ensemble mean here at about you know, two, three, four hundred. So this was a low Cape event. Yes? Question, how are all these ensemble members created? Maybe I'm missing something here. Yes, I won't go quite into the details, but um, they assimilate surface pressure observations and um, into a numerical model in using an ensemble Kalman filter. And I don't know, Victor, if you know more of the details. It's been a while since I looked. It's an ENKF replacement, so you're basically just yeah. bootstrapping and they come up with, in this case, uh, you have 56 plus the mean for a total of 57, I believe. Um, there's a paper out there that describes the data set uh, and how it's created, but it's only from surface observation stations. There's mm -hmm. no radius on, even in the current period. It's only surface pressure data that's used. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we look at the shear values, this is the ensemble mean shear. We do see we have sufficient um, vertical wind shear in this area, 15 to 20 meters per second, so you know, 30 to 40 knots or so of shear. So this seems to be a classic kind of a high shear, low cape event. You can look at the ensemble mean value of cape time shear, and generally it's on the lower, lower end of, of values for this event. But now to the fun part, actually simulating with the high resolution model at four kilometers um, uh, horizontal grid spacing. Here's just a, a sampling of nine of the 56 different ensemble members here. This is the simulated radar, if you will. And these black dots that are shown on here are where that updraft holicity value exceeds a threshold of 40 meters squared per second squared. So it's basically indicating where we have these thunderstorms, where they're rotating and potentially producing severe weather. This is actually pretty incredible. If you, if you think about it, using this data set, we're getting storms in general correct locations at about the correct time, which is pretty neat. We can look at a loop of, of um, all ensemble members of the updraft helicity 
greater than 40. And we generally, we see the same thing. We're producing rotating thunderstorms in the areas that were known to produce severe, th severe um, weather for this event. And here's just a plot for the entire day of all members here. Now, can, what can we do with this? Can we use the daily data from all members to produce some kind of guidance for the day? So similar to what the uh, Storm Prediction Center puts out for their, their convective outlooks. Well, yes, we can. We can produce a probability based on this um, updraft helicity vari variable. And in this case, there are areas here that 20 to 30 percent chance of seeing severe weather based on these model simulations. I think this would equate to slight to enhanced and then the darker pink here I would be a moderate or so if you're familiar with the, the Storm Prediction Center outlooks here. So that's just kind of wrapping up. We are putting together a website and we're looking at a bunch of other cases as well. Um, we'll have other variables to look at, not just this updraft helicity variable, but other, um, say, uh, surface pressure, temperature, et cetera, and other storm scale diagnostics as well. So stay tuned for that. We'll get a link uh, once that's up and running and hopefully Victor will send that out. Okay, switching gears. Now that we've looked at some of the past, let's transition to the future. And specifically, how might severe thunderstorms, their climatology, the characteristics of storms, how might it, might it change if we continue warming? And some of the approaches that are generally taken to examine this question are, again, looking at the environmental conditions. Um, we could do high resolution dy dynamical downscaling for regional climate. And there's also something called pseudo-global warming modeling experiments. So what's been done quite a bit in the literature is looking at how global climate models show severe weather environments changing in the future under different climate change scenarios. And generally, the consensus has been that CAPE increases dramatically because of the low-level moisture increases, while the mean uh, vertical wind shear tends to decrease. But these are on means. So when you look at the variables together, though, the number of days that support um, that would be favorable for severe weather tend to increase. But again, the, we're limited by these, um, by the fact that we're not accounting for storm initiation. And so the next kind of step to go beyond this environmental approach is to do the regional climate modeling. So what is high resolution dynamical downscaling? Well, basically this is where we use say WARF, for example, that weather research and forecasting model at high resolution, and we, we drive that based on the global climate model data. So that gets assimilated into our model and drives that forecast. Well, why do we do this? Well, we need to bridge the resolution mismatch between the global climate models and the scales which we want the information. In this case, I'm interested in, in severe thunderstorms, and those occur on much smaller scales than the global climate models, which have horizontal grid spacings of 100 to 200 kilometers. We also want to better uh, resolve some of the subgrid scale features. Um, for example, terrain can be very important. Uh, land sea contrast, so you want to get your sea breeze, or, um, your lake breeze, etc. Those are important things. And so this also allows us to address the convective initiation problem um, in which we really let this model develop the relationship between what the global climate model is saying, the environmental conditions are how they're going to change, how that would um, in turn uh, relate to events. 
Some of the drawbacks, though, is this is a garbage in, garbage out problem. So your, your high resolution models are only going to be as good as what's being input into them. So if your global climate model uh, cannot reasonably recreate, observe climatology of variables or has biases, those are going to be propagated into your, your model. So it's also very computationally expensive. Um, so it's really difficult to simulate long periods of time. Um, also, um, it also is not very feasible to do ensembles for climate change, um, regional climate change experiments. So there has been some previous work, as Victor mentioned earlier, his dissertation did uh, some downscaling work of climate models. Uh, some previous work of uh, Jeff Trapp and Eric Robinson also downscaled reanalyses um, to look at severe weather. These results uh, generally found that using a model proxy, the observed climatology of severe weather was able to be replicated fairly well. Um, but because of the computational expense, these simulations were limited to maybe 10 or 20 years and only the most convectively active months. So March, April, May, April, May, June, et cetera. So we're really lacking an entire annual cycle of, of simulation and at a longer um, time period. So this kind of was the motivating factor for some of uh, my dissertation work, where I took global climate model data from the latest couple of model intercomparison projects, so CMIP-5, um, to drive uh, a wharf simulations over the coterminous US for 30 years in the his historical period, so 1971 to 2000 and another 30-year period, 100 years in the future, using the most aggressive climate change scenario. So I have 60 years of total simulations for the entire annual cycle with hourly output. Now before we get into the results, I just kind of want to reiterate some of the computing challenges that you have when you do this. So, uh, I think within about one year, I used two million processor wall clock hours. Um, from these results, I produced over 2.2 petabytes of raw data. So luckily, I was able to convert this to a different format. So that was a little easier to work with um, on disk, so about 65 to 70 terabytes, um, which still is, is big, but it's not petabyte big. Uh, <laughs> over half a million output files because we have our, uh, hourly output at 60 years. So, so this is a significant challenge in terms of storage and for analyzing the data. Now to the fun stuff. Um, again, with these high resolution models, even at four kilometers, we really can't um, simulate severe hazards explicitly, so we have to use uh, model proxies. And so instead of the updraft helicity variable that we've talked about before, I'm instead using updraft speed. And the reason for that is I found it does a lot better in the summer and in the fall versus the updraft helicity uh, variable because of the changes in mode, uh, convective storm mode that produce severe weather. So here I'm going to be using um, upward vertical velocity greater than 22 meters per second as a proxy. Um, and we're going to look here in terms of number of days uh, of severe weather produced from this model. We upscale it to our GCM, uh, one degree lat long grid, and we're going to compare it back to what our global climate model was saying as far as severe weather environment frequencies. Because this is not something that someone is, uh, many people have looked at is what are we actually getting by doing this downscaling because it's incredibly expensive and if we're not getting any additional information that we're not already getting from these coarser resolution models that are much cheaper to run and use, then what's the point? 
And this is just an animation of, of the simulated radar, and those black dots you see are where the, um, the updraft speed exceeds 22 meters per second. So anybody want to pencil in 2099, May 15th? For a storm chase? I'm still alive. I'll <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll be 110 or something. <laughs> 15. <laughs> All right, some of the results here. Uh, the seasonal changes. On the left-hand side here, we have the projected changes in severe weather um, environments from our driving global climate model versus the wharf results of the severe weather days based on the updraft speed. And what I want to bring your attention here to is that all seasons see statistically significant increases. And they're generally pretty good correlation between what the climate model is saying and what WARF is saying, with the exception of the summer months. While both uh, tend to show that the Northern Plains will light, light up. Uh, a different story in the southern and central plains is indicated from WARF where we see little to no change or actually decreases in um, severe weather frequency. And this is really driven by the month of July if we look at uh, the changes in severe weather days modeled um, by WARF. And I have some um, ideas of what this is, which I will probably talk about a little bit later. We can look at the probability of seeing a severe weather day within our simulations here. So this is anywhere in the US if we have an updraft exceeding 22 meters per second, looking at that probability. So the blue curve here is the historical period the red is the future. We see that the greatest increases in the probability come in the tails of the distribution, so the cool season. Um, and probability is already high in the warm season, so we don't have much increases there. But that's a pretty interesting result. We can also, this right-hand figure, if we take the cumulative distribution function of the accumulated number of days, so basically what we want to look at when are we accumulating our days every year. The blue line, again, the historical period, red, future. What I want you to glean from this figure is that in the future, we're having more severe weather days earlier in the season and more severe weather days later in the season. So we're effectively lengthening our severe weather season so 60, the, where we have 60% of our accumulated total number of severe weather days based on this model, uh, this is increasing by 23 days. Notable too is that the more intense storms, so updrafts with greater than 30, 35, and 40 meters per second are also increasing in the spring and summer season. So. Good news for trip five, COD, in the summer, <laughs> Northern Plains. <laughs> but let's kind of go back and look at that relation of what the global climate model is saying versus our regional climate model of WARF. So we have monthly mean um, severe weather environment days it's here on your x-axis and then monthly mean severe days from our, our regional climate model. And again, the blue is the historical period, red is the future. And what we're seeing here is that the severe uh, environments are increasing dramatically in, in the future, but their efficiency of producing severe thunderstorms is not the same. So something is going on here. We can see a very similar story if we look at the number of grid boxes that, so this is a spatial sense, the number of grid boxes that have severe weather environments and severe um, thunderstorms in our downscaled model. So 
The solid lines are uh, the historical and future uh, severe weather days from the global climate model, and the dashed lines are the severe weather days from our regional climate model. So what you see here is that from the future to the past, we have a greater surface area of the, of the US that is covered by severe environments, but that increase is not proportional with the severe weather reports. We can see that too also in the accumulated number of grid boxes every single year. So basically what this says is that we're getting a whole lot more environments but they're not always producing severe thunderstorms the way they did in the past. So basic summary here is that we see increased frequency and intensity of severe thunderstorms. Uh, these projections show a longer severe weather season. We generally see a consistent agreement between the driving climate model and um, the regional climate model here produced by WARF um, in terms of the seasonal cycle. We get the when and the where, but not that how much. So this tends to justify the use of, of downscaling for these purposes. Now, what is changing this efficiency or this conditional probability between the historical and future periods? Um, there's a, an incredible um, uh, increase in the amount of convective inhibition. So the cap is getting stronger, which is helping to suppress some of those storms, particularly in the central and the southern Great Plains. Uh, there's also in this, this climate model uh, a reduction in the amount of extratropical cyclones, which would produce um, some of those lifting mechanisms to get the storms to go. We also see that there's um, maybe a changing, a strengthening low level jet and a shift in the upper level jet as well. So, yeah. How am I doing on time, Victor? Good. Okay, excellent. All right, so we'll move on to some other work that I've done to kind of look at this climate change problem. And this is called a pseudo global warming approach or PGW. And really, this involves simulating some event um, as a control and then adjusting the input data to the model by some climate change delta. What I mean by that is you know, taking some difference between the means between some past and future period. So for example, if we had uh, a sounding similar to this, we wanted to add a climate change delta we do this for many of the vertical uh, levels in the vertical and at the surface. So we change these input in, uh, and boundary conditions to our model, and we try to find out how the ensuing storms might change. This approach is mostly used on a case-based uh, event, so we simulate some known historical event and try to see how might that event change given some uh, changes in the, in the climate. But it, some have used this in a regional climbing um, context. So the motivating uh, research questions for the, the results that I'm going to show you here are given late 21st century conditions, um, how would a set of three different high-end tornado events be realized under these new conditions? Would they be more intense? Would they change their morphology? In that way, as we're getting at this, this question of, will significantly tornadic supercells of today, will they become just more generic squall lines of tomorrow? So the events that I'm going to show you today, we have three different um, of, uh, tornado events, two EF5s and uh, one EF4. And we have three different um, climate models which we produce our monthly mean uh, deltas from. And so this produces nine primary experiments. So we, we apply these deltas 
uh, from these three different climate models for these three different events. We have also 36 different additional sensitivity experiments where we, we play around with just applying the wind the, or the kinematic changes, um, only the thermodynamic changes. Uh, we could play around with the soil uh, moisture and temperature values um, and also just the moisture as well. So I won't get quite into the details of, of the model setup, but if you have questions, we can go over that later. So here's just a quick example of one of the experiments. Um, I believe this was the Shawnee tornado case. So we have our control on the left and our PGW on the right. And we see some differences in the location of the storms and the onset of initiation in some cases. The overall results tend to show that many of these uh, PGW experiments fail to initiate convection. And this is due because of the increased sin in or convective inhibition in these that are helping to suppress convection in these future experiments. Also some of these uh, events saw a delayed onset of convection by one to two hours, so maybe it was taking a longer time to overcome the cap. Um, but those storms that did get to punch through the, the cap saw a greater updraft speed and greater vertical um, rotation in the storms as well. Well, what's interesting to know is that the enhanced updraft speed was not in proportion to the, the increased CAPE. So we can relate CAPE to a theoretical maximum updraft speed in a storm by uh, square root of two times CAPE. Um, and so we, we see that while the theoretical uh, updraft speeds should increase quite a bit. We didn't see them increase in proportion from our actual storms. And the reason for this is we saw quite a bit more precipitation loading within our storms. And what that means is we have more, more rain, more ice, more grapple that tends to inhibit the buoyancy within our storms and reducing the updraft. And lastly, we saw no real change in the convective morphology. But really, that's likely because these were such high-end events anyway, we were already in the more extreme area of the cape shear space. So really high cape, really high shear. So even a reduction in, in, in shear wouldn't really change the morphology at all. So those were the, just kind of the, the results of that experiment. We're doing some more um, events to look at, say, hail events, uh, looking at severe weather outbreaks, but also looking at those more marginal events or, or squall line events to see how changing things, uh, how sensitive the systems would be to that. So this is a case um, I simulated the uh, April 27, 2011, uh, severe weather outbreak in the, in the south here. So pretty neat kind of stuff here. With that, I will leave you with, um, I think, a very appropriate quote here is, essentially all models are wrong. Some are useful. I hope mine are useful. <laughs> <laughs> So with that, I'll, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Questions for Kim. Uh, I'll start here in the front with uh, Mike. If you can just hold on until you get the mic so it'll be re, uh, recorded for our later upload to YouTube. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, just a couple of questions about the 20th century reanalysis. Yes. You said it was all based on surface pressure fields or surface fields. Does that include surface fields such as temperature and dew point, or is no, it just pressure? just pressure. Just pressure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, and then when you were modeling the tri-state tornado based on the 20th century reanalysis, mm -hmm. where did the upper level data come from, and what's your level of confidence in, in the upper level data? 
Well, the upper level data was generated based on those surface pressure observations. Um, they do some things I, hydrostatically with trying to figure out um, things in the upper levels. I have to go back and read the paper for the details. And, those people are much smarter than me. <laughs> it is absolutely remarkable how they create that data set. And I give all that kudos to Gil Campo out at NOAA yes. Sizzle. Uh, we talked to him for two hours about recreating this data set from nothing but surface pressure. Mm -hmm. And then comparing it to the radio sonde era data that we have, and you see the confidence, the correlation is incredible between only having surface pressure. So then the idea is, okay, well, we have surface pressure back to 1800s, let's go ahead and extrapolate this backwards. Now there is some low pressure bias, as Kim mentioned. At yeah, the really the uncertainty early part is a lot greater because of the density is less of these surface pressure observations. So. It's amazing what you can do with just surface pressure. But generally speaking, that level of confidence is pretty high. Yes. Interesting. Thank you very much. Yep. Kim, a I have point. a question. Um, yeah. And I'm a little confused about the, uh, the way that you use the, the wharf to, uh, in the downscaling. Okay. Uh, so you have this, the climate models that have a background state and it generates some activity that you are able to have a higher resolution during the day. How does that feed back into the model for let's say the next day, et cetera? Like oh, well, how there's is- There's no feedback up into the large scale global climate model. So we're just strictly downscaling those conditions. Per day? Per day, Okay. yep. And that also brings me back to the, the way I am doing this, is I am initializing every single day, too. I'm not running it continuously, so yes. Would, would that have any effect over the course of a year, then? If, I mean, if you have the GCM that's not doing a proper convection uh, algorithm, mm -hmm. then the convection that's actually occurring that you can see in some of the smaller scale models doesn't that influence the larger scale environment? It can, yeah. Convection can definitely uh, feed back into the larger scales, um, but there's no uh, nested feedback here up to the large scales. We're strictly going downscale, not back upscale. But that. Yeah. Your methodology would be called two way nesting, yes. which is twice as computationally expensive than the, what she's doing. So, yeah. That. Four petaflops. <laughs> or, <laughs> petaflops. Data. But people try that. There, there, are, yeah. there are lots of different approaches. Um, and one thing I think that, Kim, if you want to elaborate on this, your methodology was re initialization, where yes. some of the other research was. Yes, uh, it, and there's been some previous research shown that re initialization helps to. Uh, prevent climate drift away from the base state of your driving model. Because if you kind of continuously integrate your higher resolution model without kind of bringing it back to, um, or nudging it back to the, the state of the, the driving model, you can have a completely different climatology in your, your high resolution versus your driving model. And so some of my results clearly show that we're, we're kind of in sync here. So. Kim, one more question, though. I want to get back into the, uh, the tri-state. Yeah. Um, it reminds me, Victor, of your Utica the day, where there was a very narrow uh, band of, of instability that formed much higher than this 500 joules per kilogram mm -hmm. uh, in, in that event. And I'm just, it started making me think about the data back then. And what were, do you, did you have any feeling for the observation density Back in the 20s, like where in southern Illinois would there have been a reporting I don't, station? But I can look it up because the, the, pr the pressure observations that are assimilated into the 20th century analysis, I believe they're available for download. So that's something we could look into. I, yeah, I don't think there was. I a felt really comfortable in that study about circa 1920. Mm -hmm. After that, I I'm did a couple 1800s events and. Yeah. Yeah, they were a little. Dan, I mean, were you, there's a, there's were you a around back in the event that looks <laughs> yeah. pretty good, but. <laughs> no, I think what you're going to, there, there might have been a pocket of higher cape, but the spatial resolution of 20 CR is not going to allow for that. Yeah. The key was, is this thing formed on a gradient, and I think a lot of the case studies, if you look back at the tri-state, they've shown this. There's a, that storm formed on the triple point pretty much in the low. Yeah, it probably just. tracked with the warm yeah. front. As yeah, it, it, was, it was a perfect. Perfect yeah. setup for that one. Too. And we do have CAPE in, in our downscale model. I just didn't pull it out. So we can see at the, the four kilometer horizontal spacing what the CAPE would have been no. in those simulations. Yeah. So there's probably 
a small area higher. Okay. Tri-state tornado, that's almost 100 years ago. 1925, that's oh, only, wow, that's we're only so, we, <laughs> oh most God. of us should be alive by then. <laughs> and I say most. You wanna pass the mic to Noah? Uh, hey, Kim, I wanted to know if there's any effort being made into machine learning algorithms for global climate forecasts, because I feel like maybe the processing power would go down significantly if you did, like, trained a machine learning algorithm based on the trends we know, rather than downscale the models we already have. So the answer I is know. you should apply to graduate school at NIU. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a good people, thesis or dissertation topic. We have people working on this problem right now. Yes. Um, I know you could apply the machine learning to the downscaled simulations. That's what's happening. Yeah. Right so in other words, there's people right now, in fact, Alex Haberly at Northern Illinois is trying to track MCSs through machine learning. Um, I think, it, to be honest with you, if I see something that's coming down the pike in the next 15 to 20 years, it's AI and machine learning on forecast data sets and historical data sets so that we don't have to go through all this dynamical modeling framework. Yeah, because that's what I was thinking was that there's so much data and it's almost impossible for us to parse through it, so. Not only that, when you get the answer, you see what her simulations show, you get nothing at the end of the day more than some reports that are, are nested to a grid that then produce a probability. You can save a lot of time if, you, if all you're getting at the end of the day or all you're interested in are the, are the background probabilities save you a lot of time by just doing mm -hmm. machine learning. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question, Noah. Thank you once again for coming. If you have any questions or comments and you want to talk to Kim. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.